you on to my talk, Disrupting Full Text Search with JavaScript. And yeah, let me present myself with just one slide. I'm Michele. And guess where I come from? Right. Who does put pineapple on pizza here? Let's be honest. We will have a separate conversation about that later, but I, I don't really care. I'm just kidding around, <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about full text search, of course, and how I'm, I'm trying with my team to, to change an industry. But I want to start from where I first fell in love with open source uh, software and search in particular, and that was Elasticsearch. So in my past, I had the opportunity to work on Apache You Know Me, which is a customer data platform. Uh, I was contributing to that project, and it was using Elasticsearch as its main uh, leader database in the infrastructure. And it was incredible to me to see how fast it was uh, being while throwing millions and millions of records, and it was still having good performances. That, that was just it, it was blow, uh, blowing me away every single time. And I couldn't stop thinking, how is that possible? How is that magic about? Like, there's no way you can do this uh, without magic, right? So I started investigating into the core of Elasticsearch by looking at you know, the open source project. And I eventually found out that, yes, Elasticsearch, it's a very complete project, but it actually wraps Apache Lucene, which is the actual full text search library. And Elasticsearch provides RESTful interface, distributed system capabilities, automatic sharding, data consistency, monitoring, cluster management. It can provide everything you, you wish on top of Apache Lucene to provide the best search experience possible at the time. And I want a big disclaimer from now on. Um, as they just, just said, I'm working in a search company, and I want this to be very clear. I love Elasticsearch. I love it. And I, want to, I wanted to recreate it, uh, to learn more about it, and to solve some pretty problems that I had using with it. So I had some problems, of course, with Elasticsearch in my past. Like, it's not super easy to deploy, especially if you're a single developer or an indie hacker. You, know, you, was, you just want to perform search, and it's not super easy to do that um, alone. It's pretty hard to upgrade once you get enough nodes and enough um, distributed clusters. Uh, it has a big memory footprint, CPU consumption, and that leads to cost management, which is another pain point. It's hard to extend and customize, but most of all, Java. Oh my god, I had to code Java again. No. And uh, that was the major pain point, I gotta be honest. But apart from that, I also tried Algolia, you know, another big full text search engine out there. And Algolia, it's fantastic. Like, it's phenomenal. It's super performant. It's really easy to integrate. It was developer first, so all the APIs were just working fine. But still, it's very expensive at scale, you know, so it's a trade off, of course. Um, it's a big black box because it's closed source, so you cannot either extend it as you wish. And, you know, it's really difficult to understand how they do their magic, and that's really important for me. So, I also want to uh, uh, state that maybe I was too inexpert at the time, and maybe Elasticsearch and Algolia were a bit too much for me. But I also believe that making simple software, while it's hard, it's part of the responsibility for us as developers, right? So I wanted to give that a try. And I set some goals. So the only way I can learn something is by doing. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the quote, what I cannot create, I do not understand from Richard Feynman. So this is how I learn. So I set myself a goal. I want to give a conference talk on how full text search engine works. I want to create a new kind of full text search engine. So let's see if I can try to innovate in my uh, little domain for, for once and make it easy to adopt, massively scalable, easy to extend. OK, that's not so easy. That was for later, of course. And of course, as soon as I started, I had to go through the theory behind full text search. So I had to learn about trees, graphs, engrams, causing similarity, so vector search. Nowadays, it's pretty popular, right? BN25, TFIDF, tokenization, stemming, lemmaization, and more and more and more. There's a lot going on. And we just saw this GIF, uh, but it's still relevant, I guess. Uh, the theory behind full text search, it's incredibly dense, and it's incredibly difficult uh, if you don't have anyone explaining it to you, which, of course, was the case. <laughs> so I eventually discovered the hard truth about it, that you need to study algorithms in data structures, and you need that a lot. So once you start studying them, and it's getting harder and harder, you, you still need a programming language to implement them, right? So of course, I choose the best programming language out there, because I wanted to be a cool guy and choose the right programming language for the job. 
right? <laughs> I saw people like that right now. Yeah, give an applause to Haskell. I always make fun of it, but <laughs> thank you for the very shy applause to Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, but yeah, of course, I wanted to be a cool kid, as I said. So I tried with Rust and say, oh my God, no, Rust is really complicated, right? I was coming from Haskell, so I said, yeah, Rust can't be that difficult. Spoiler, it is. Uh, but <laughs> of course. Um, so I said, no, no, maybe you know what? I'll rewrite part of the algorithms in Go. So garbage collected, easier. Uh, someone said that like Golang is the Florida of JavaScript. So, <laughs> you know, when you grow older, you just go to Florida and, and let the, the tight system do the rest, I guess. I, I don't really know. <laughs> but it was fun, and it wasn't even easy. Um, but eventually, I remembered um, a law in programming, which is called the Jeff, uh, the Atwood law from just Jeff Atwood, the co-founder of Stack Overflow. Any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I choose the king of programming languages, JavaScript. And one thing that I discovered is that while I was translating some algorithms badly written, of course, in Rust and Golang, Haskell, no, I'm kidding, uh, into JavaScript, I found out that JavaScript is actually very performant, and I'm not talking about just browsers, I'm also talking about uh, Node.js, Dino, Ban. I, I tried literally everything, and they were all very performant, except for Rhino, but that's another runtime and don't want to discuss right now. So my point, my main takeaway for this talk is, in my opinion, there is no slow programming language out there. There is just bad algorithms in data structures design. So I want to give you an example. I found myself stuck in a situation where I had to compute the intersection between more arrays, and I had no idea how these arrays were formed. I didn't know how many arrays did I have, uh, their shape, how long they were, nothing. So this is, of course, the first thing you do. You just use map reduce. As a former functional programming guy here, of course, that's what I did. So map reduce. Then I said, okay, you know what? This, this is not very fast. Let's try an iterative approach. Might be a bit faster. And then I found out, like, wait, what if I start the intersection from the smaller uh, array? So I, I only have to loop over the smaller one every time for compute the intersection. So just one line. Now, how many of you think that the first solution is the fastest one? Okay. Who thinks the second one is the fastest? Who thinks this is the fastest one? Still a few people, but let me show you. Uh, so if I'm, I found out that Functional programming in JavaScript, for example, it's, it's lower than iterative, uh, sorry, than uh, imperative programming, but badly written imperative program, <laughs> programs are performing worse than uh, well written functional programs. So still, you, you really need to understand what's going on. And that brings me to another point that I'm showing you in just one second. Um, I'm talking about array intersections for multiple reasons. We will discuss later, but this is an example of a PR that I sent to a secret project that I'm showing you in just one second. And basically, this PR is incrementing the performances of a full text search engine by 50% just by the way you intersect arrays. That's crazy. Then, of course, if you want high performance JavaScript, you have to know your language and how to optimize for the runtime. So there are multiple runtimes out there. Some runtimes hit certain optimizations, other runtimes hit others. So if you think of, for example, JavaScript core for Safari uh, and WebKit in general, uh, it has certain um, optimization that you can adopt. But V8, so Dino, and uh, Node.js, and Chrome, for example, they have totally different approaches. Um, there are a lot of art uh, good articles, actually. Like, do you know the difference between monomorphism and polymorphism in functions? Like monomorphism, for those who don't know, are functions that only accept uh, arguments of a, of a type, of a specific type. So it's really easy to understand that in TypeScript. Um, but if you, for example, create a um, function called add. So you know, in JavaScript, when you, in, um, when you concatenate two strings, you use the plus operator, right? But you can also uh, compute the addition between two numbers using the plus operation. So you could also use the function add to um, compute the addition between two numbers or concatenate strings, but that makes the function polymorphic. Therefore, it's converted like to a C++ auto under the hood, which is lower than a monomorphic function. So these kind of optimizations are crazy, but if you want to get in the microseconds area, and we're getting there in just one second, this is what you need to think about. 
there is an amazing uh, repository that I really prompt you to go see. Um, it's a wiki, actually, from the Bluebird um, repository, which is called Optimization Killers. All this is wrong in TurboFan. Um, so it's a list, it's an incredible list of optimization that you can apply to your code today to make it faster, at least on Node.js and V8 runtimes in general. There is another very interesting optimization that you can run, for example, on V8. So again, Dino, Node.js, Chrome, etc. And I want to show you this from a library called Too Fast Properties. Uh, so basically, every time you change the shape of an object in JavaScript, you're slowing it down because you, you lose memorization, you lose a lot of uh, optimization that the runtime can provide you. So it basically ju does just one thing. This is the entire library, right? Can you spot what's going on here to make, to make the object fast after you edit it? Can you see it? Let me show you. Oh, no, I, I already highlighted this. OK. So we call to fast object 10 times without any argument at all. And we warm up the inline optimization of the runtime. I've never thought of something like that. This, this is nuts, right? But this is how you hit optimizations sometimes, of course. So uh, this is my biased opinion. Again, as a former functional programming guy, uh, I want to say, do you want fast JavaScript? Just write it as you write C. That's really it. Uh, it's bad. But it's a trade-off you have to take if you really want performances, if you truly care about performances. And once you know how to optimize it, a JavaScript can be very performant. And you can easily make your code work in the microseconds area. We will see that in just one minute. Um, as I said at the beginning of this talk, I gave myself um, um, a task. So I wanted to give a talk about full text search engine. I've been lucky enough to participate to uh, the We Are Developers World Congress, where I um, talked about a tiny full text search engine that I was writing back then while I was at Nearform, a uh, company that sponsored the project in the first place. And I was working with a very uh, good team that you can see here. And we were all working together on this to make it very, very uh, fast and performant, etc. And at a certain point, uh, one person, I don't know who that person is, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, we developed Lira, which is the name of the full text search engine that we were developing. And one person took this, the link to the repository, put it on Hacker News, and we've been there for like two days in a row on the front page. And we, we did the only thing that a, I don't know, same person would have done at that, that stage. I tried to steal as much people I could from Nearform. <laughs> That's basically what happened. And we founded a company, we founded Dorama. And at Rama, we are developing this full text search engine that I'm going to show you in just one second. So these are the co-founders, as you can see here. So at, at its glance, Rama, it's just a JavaScript library. You just import it. You define a schema for your database. So you can use numbers, strings, uh, booleans. Uh, you can have nested fields, et cetera. You can insert data, of course, in the database. And as you can see here, for example, why? Oops. Why are we passing the entire database as a parameter for the insert function? Why are we modifying the object's shape? Uh, we found out this is faster than using classes, for example. That's another kind of optimization we discovered later that we were, weren't expecting. So OK. Um, by the way, this is like the best movie ever. If you haven't saw that, please go see that. And OK, so you insert data. And at a certain point, you can just uh, query for data, right? And what makes Rama so special? So I can't show you a lot of things right now, but uh, it has a large feature set that you can test it right now. I got nothing to sell. It's open source. You can go there and download it. We have like facet supports, typo tolerance, stop words, uh, filters, fields busting. And most importantly, we have components and hooks, which means that if I'm convincing you that algorithms and data structures are important, you can test your skills by using our own test suite to test your algorithms and your data structure. Because for example, we use a Patricia tree for storing words. And you can implement your own radix tree, prefix tree, whatever. We provide an opaque interface for every single data structure we use. And you can use our uh, test suite to test if your implementation is faster, if your implementation is correct, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really interesting for me uh, to use such a project to test um, how your learning process about algorithm and data structure is going. And most importantly, of course, um, it's written in JavaScript without any dependency at all. So it runs whatever JavaScript runs. So literally, whatever JavaScript runs. And 
extend, it's extendable in plain JavaScript via the built-in hooks and component system again. So whenever you insert something, uh, you, can, uh, you can hook into the insertion process. When you're searching something, you can hook into the insertion process so you can like say, okay, you know what? I have few t-shirts left in stock. I will boost the results for t-shirts, for example. Why not? Or I know this user, so this user um, buys a lot of black shoes, so I will boost the results for black shoes for these uh, users only. Why not? And it's insanely fast. We, me me we actually measure search time microseconds. If you don't believe me, let me show you a quick demo. Give me just one quick second. Here it is. So. Okay, internet is going, I guess, yeah. So um, I have 20,000 products right now, and as soon as I click on popular database, I will be downloading 20,000 products, index, it, index them uh, inside the browser, and also have a remote server that serves uh, the, uh, the same catalog. So it should take about three seconds. All right, so these are all the results. So every single product out there, 84 milliseconds. If I go here, for example, and search for, I don't know, Blanket. It takes 38 milliseconds, meaning I start measuring when I first made the request from the browser. It went to the server and then back in 38 milliseconds while searching through 20,000 products. And you can say, yeah, you know what? It's still fat. It's still pretty slow. Um, I can go like using the local index, and this is taking one millisecond. There is some throttling, so sometimes numbers go a bit crazy, but, but still, if I search for, I don't know, uh, pillow, for example, 200 microseconds. And like the implementation, it's open source. So you can go and see how we measure this. It's, uh, it's inside our monorepo. You can go and just see it. Um, whenever internet connection drops, you just go uh, offline. It, it's working at a glance. And again, you can re-enable uh, whatever you wish, uh, the remote server. And again, 29 milliseconds for the same query. And this is, again, I don't want this to be a kind of a, a sales pitch because I got nothing to sell again. This is free and open source, you can do it. Uh, but actually, it's a success story for JavaScript because it's actually nowadays competing with giants like Algolia and Elasticsearch, et cetera. And that's the purpose for, for this talk. So at its glance, we wanted Orama to be cheaper, better, faster uh, enterprise search, of course, uh, because we see value in building such fast products with such customizable uh, features. and most important thing is that if you're using Orama, um, you don't have to manage clusters because of how it's constructed. You don't have server provisioning uh, to provision your server, sorry. Um, you don't have performance degradation. Let's say you run them on networks of any kind. You, you don't need to think about that. And it's as simple to use as a JavaScript library. And that's not all. Uh, let me follow the buzz for a moment about LLMs. Yes, you can expand your queries, bring your own LLM or do, uh, let Orama do its magic for you, and yeah, yeah, I'm talking about ChatGPT and Bard, of course. So if you're interested in learning more about Orama, how it works, how to interact uh, with it, and how to implement on your, um, on your project, uh, please feel free to scan the QR code, and yeah, we have a Slack channel. If you have any question, I'll be there ask, uh, answering and helping you in any possible way with my team. And that was all for me. Thank you so much for having me. It has been an honor, as always.